Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Area. The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Good morning, welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle ERIC Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. My name is Ed Boyko, I'm the course director. The title of today's course is Epidemiologic Aspects of Military Post-Deployment Health Conditions, Natural Disasters and Terrorism. I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Ken Taneda, who is a senior researcher of the Department of Policy Sciences at the National Institute of Public Health in uh, Japan. He also spent uh, six years uh, here in Seattle as a fellow in uh, health services and epidemiology training programs where I served as one of his mentors. He also uh, is a clinical instructor in the, the Department of Health Services uh, in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. The title of uh, his talk today is Epidemiologic Aspects of Terrorist Acts. Dr. Taneda. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, I was a chief resident at St. Luke's International Hospital, Tokyo, in 1995, when sarin nerve gas was intentionally re released in the Tokyo subway system, causing uh, mass casualties. Our hospital was one of those nearby receiving an influx of these victims of the sarin gas attack. It is my great, uh, great pleasure to have an opportunity to share my experience at St. Luke's International Hospital, Tokyo, in the immediate aftermath of this sarin gas attack with you today. I hope that similar incident will not happen in the future, but you would find some useful information for the preparedness against the terrorist, terrorist attacks at your institution in my talk. Uh, on the Monday morning, March 20th, 1995, 15 stations of Tokyo subway system were filled with toxic substance, which was later identified as a diluted form of sarin nerve gas. Five subway trains were attacked during the Monday rush hour. According to the traffic white paper, the capacity of Tokyo subway system trains between 8 a.m. and 8.40 a.m. reached more than 200%, which means that it was too crowded for the passengers to read open the newspapers, although they might have been able to read magazines or paperbacks. So the inside of the subway trains in that morning could have looked like this picture. I think probably it was more crowded. The attack occurred around 8 o'clock. According to the later police announcements, the terrorists respectively carried the diluted sarin gas, a sarin solution in plastic bags, plastic bags into the five subway trains and simultaneously stack the sharpened tip of an umbrella into the bags. As a consequence, 12 people were killed and more than 5,000 people became victims. This attack was the second documented incident of the nerve gas attack in Japan. The same nerve gas was used in the previous year in Matsumoto City, Japan, by the same cult group. In that previous case, seven people were killed and around 600 people became victims. This is the data from the Tokyo Fire Department showing the number of vic victims seen at the major hospitals in Tokyo. The number of victims is a little bit different from our data, but the, the point I'd like to make here is that our hospital received the greatest number of victims. This is a picture of St. Luke's International Hospital, Tokyo, which I worked for at the time. The hospital is a private teaching hospital having 520 beds, originally founded by an American missionary doctor in 1902. This is an aerial photo of the hospital. As you can see, the hospital is located in the very crowded and busy place, Tokyo. 
And this slide shows the map of Tokyo subway. Each colored line represents uh, one subway line. St. Luke's International Hospital was located in here, a uh, blue circle, uh, on this map. From the previous slide, I have picked up the three affected subway lines. That is red, green, and blue lines with uh, uh, 15 affected stations in yellow circles on this map. These three lines go through the Kasumigaseki Station, where there are the National Police Agency and the Metropolitan Police Board, as well as the Japanese government office quarter. The terrorists wanted to kill those employees. Our hospital was close to one of the most affected stations, called Tsukiji Station, uh, which is about a five-minute walk. Our hospital was the largest around this area, and then we received the greatest number of patients, 640 in Tokyo. This slide shows the number of the victims we received from each subway station. From the Tsukiji Station, which I mentioned in, in the previous slide, we received around 100 patients. As you can see, the most patients came from Kodemacho Station, which was around three kilometers, or 1.5 miles away from our hospital. Uh, beginning with this slide, I'd like to talk about the responses of a hospital uh, along the course of the event at the time. On that morning, all the core staff, including the president and the vice presidents, were participating in a regular meeting from 8 o'clock. At 8.16, the emergency room, or ER, received an emergency call from the Tokyo Fire Department informing a gas explosion at nearby subway stations uh, occurred and requesting us to see the victims. I think that having all decision makers on the site was one of the factors which lessened the initial confusion at the hospital. So here is a question for you. How would you contact all decision makers if they are not present on the site? On, the morning, on that morning, I was attending a clinical teaching conference with other residents as a medicine chief resident from 8 o'clock. Around 8.30, the vice president paged me and said, gas explosion has occurred at nearby subways. Send some residents to help ER staff after the conference. So it didn't sound so urgent to me at the time. At 8.28, 12 minutes after the call from the fire department, first three victims walked into the ER and the other 20 patients followed in a few minutes. The most of them complained of eye pain, eye pain uh, visual darkness, lacrimation or tears in eyes, and dyspnea or difficulties in breathing. The first ambulance at ER at 8.40 am, three minutes later, a victim with cardiopulmonary arrest a CPA was brought in by a private car, followed by another CPA victim. Thereafter, more than 500 victims were rushed to emergency room successively. Until this point of time, I was still in the conference and didn't know anything about this chaotic situation yet. At 8.55, an emergency call-up, stat call, stat call EL, was placed throughout the entire hospital, and all available care providers were mobilized to ER to assist with managing the victims. It was very unusual that uh, ER asked for urgent help from non-ER care providers. However, we responded to the call and rushed to the ER, which was just before finishing the conference. At that time, because of a gas explosion information from the vice president, I was anticipating to see many burned and injured patients. So here's another question I'd like you to think about. Who would ask for urgent, uh, help, urgent enormous help at the institution and how? Despite the gas explosion information, the most patients looked like these ladies. They complained of uh, blurred vision, lacrimation, dyspnea, cough, rhinorrhea, or runny nose, and nausea. 
Also, there were some very sick patients. This is a picture of the ER entrance. A few minutes later, a young woman was brought into the ER. She was not breathing. We tried to resuscitate her very hard. However, she didn't respond to our effort and expired in the ER. In the next room of the ER, I found that other staff were trying to resuscitate another patient. I was very shocked and scared. And I was very afraid how many patients in cardiopulmonary arrest would be brought in. Then I also realized that it would be impossible to transport this deceased young lady patient's body to the hospital mortuary without going through a large crowd of other suffering victims. Since I didn't want to cause panic and further worrisome among the other victims, we pretended that we were carrying a very sick patient to another room by putting an oxygen mask onto the expired woman's face and covering her body with a blanket. At the mortuary of the hospital basement, I asked the nurse to make enough space to keep as many, uh, to keep as many bodies as possible in the case. Although fortunately, we had only five of the most crit critically ill patients and, and only one of them died on the day. However, you may need to think about where and how would you keep many deceased victims at your institution if necessary. This is a list of our five critically uh, sick patients who needed intubations because of CPA or respira respiratory arrest. Among them, two patients died. One of them was my patient, the third case on this list, who was just 32 years old and died in the ER. The other deceased patient was the first case of this list, who was 21 years old. She responded to a resuscitation but passed away on the 28th hospital day due to the irreversible anoxic brain damage. The other uh, three cases were discharged without apparent uh, problem, fortunately. Interestingly, interestingly, the last two cases described later that when they were admitted, they were fully conscious but unable to breathe at the time. This is another picture of the ER entrance. I'd like to show the videotape which recorded, uh, recorded the scene of a hospital accidentally on the day of the uh, attack. The Department of Nursing of a hospital was planning to make an educational videotape and therefore we had a professional movie cameraman ready for recording in the hospital. As a matter of course, they switched the plan to recording the circumstances and the actions of the hospital. Please start the video. So this is a ER entrance. So this is a taxi, cab. Interestingly, uh, taxis or cabs played a major role for patients' transportation at the time.
I think uh, this is a, a private car or van. Probably the driver passed by the uh, affected subway stations and then kindly brought those patients to the hospital. So we collected all the available portable beds down to the uh, ER entrance. So more cars are coming. This is a kind of minibus. I think uh, because of the so many patients, uh, the fire, uh, fire department uh, decided to uh, use this kind of minibus. more ambulances are coming. The doctor said uh, she is uh, pregnant, so we need to have uh, help from an uh, 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 OBGY doctor. By the way, this video is not edited at all, so you can imagine a lot of patients were rushed to the hospital in a very short time period. This is an interesting scene. Uh, the firefighter is kindly, kindly bringing a patient's shoes and bag into the ER, but these are probably contaminated with uh, sarin gas. So in fact, the secondary exposure became a big problem later on.
Okay, I'd like to show uh, the inside of the hospital. So uh, could you forward, move forward the video a little bit? Okay, here. So this is the inside of the hospital at the time. This is the uh, hallway inside the hospital. Yeah, patients were everywhere. Uh, this is a chapel. We had a chapel inside the hospital. You can see the cross over there and a lot of the IV stands. Okay, I'd like to end the video and go back to uh, my regular slides. So this is one of the affected station, stations, Tsukiji Station, which is located within a five to six minute walk from a hospital. As you can see, uh, there are enormous number of ambulances and a couple of tents. However, there was no decontamination area at the time. This is another picture of the site. The Tokyo Metropolitan Ambulance Control Center was in a chaotic state on that day, and their communication system was almost bursting at the seams. This is another picture of the site. Firefighters are taking care of a lady patient. Since we didn't know a causative agent early on, and we never ever thought any possibility of the use of nerve gas and its secondary exposure. The victims were not told, told, told to take off their clothing or belongings, which were probably contaminated with sarin nerve gas. Another picture of the site, firefighter with uh, special suits are about to go down to a subway station. 9.12 a.m. Approximately one hour after the attack, we had a, a report from the firefighter department saying that a suspected agent was acetonitrile. However, since almost all victims showed a contraction of the pupils of the eyes, and some patients had low level of serum choline esterase, we suspected an organ of phosphorus or a carbamate pesticide to be a causative agent. Then we secured intravenous route 
of all victims and began to give atropine sulfate. At the same time, a literature retrieval group was organized and some doctors of the group were in charge of collecting medical information on the suspected agent because we had no idea about it at all. So here's a question for you. How would you manage an unknown causative agent? At 9.20, the president of the hospital decided to cancel all routine operations and outpatients clinics. Here's another question. Who would make such a critical decision at your institution if necessary? Around 10 a.m., the first handwritten handout was distributed to the hospital staff, informing the following. The causative agent is still unknown. Secure IV route, give IV atropine sulfate. Uh, watch uh, patients carefully, especially their vital signs, signs of pup size of pupils, and symptoms of dyspnea. This is the actual handout. Although this handout was a very preliminary version, it helped the staff working for patients separately in various areas of the hospital. There are many things going on at the same time. Around 9.30, one and a half hours after the attack, we were informed that sarin gas was the most likely a causative agent by the president of the Shinshu University Hospital who experienced the sarin gas incident at, Matsumoto, at Matsumoto City in the previous year. In addition, at 10 o'clock, we received the same information by a doctor of the Self-Defense Forces Hospital. Based on their information and our clinical findings, we started administering the IV-2 PAM, which was an antidote of sarin gas, to some of the critical patients first. At 10.30, the first press interview was held by the hospital. Probably you could imagine the chaos and the confusion within the hospital due to uh, not only the mass casualties, their families and friends, but also the, this kind of large crowd of press agencies who were walking around inside and outside the hospital at the time. Then the press interview was helpful to mitigate this chaotic situation. So I'd like you to think about whether you have a risk or a crisis communication strategy to implement, to implement in such a situation. At 11 o'clock, some of our staff who were off duty and watching TV happened to learn that the, the Metropolitan Police Board identified sarin gas as a causative agent. Unfortunately, we do not have any direct information from the police at all. I thought this was a really bad example of our communication with outside agencies until a couple of years ago. However, after the 9-11 attack in the United States, which I knew on TV, I have been thinking that TB may be uh, not a bad way to inform the important message to uh, as many people as possible and as soon as possible. So I'd like you to think about how you, you would communicate with outside agencies, such as police department, in such a chaotic situation at your institution. Perhaps somebody has to keep watching TB, <laughs> listening radio, or checking the internet without taking care of patients. I'd like to stop my first session here, and I hope that you get some ideas what could happen in the first couple of hours soon after the chemical terrorist attacks. And I'd like to acknowledge my former colleagues and mentors at St. Luke's International Hospital, Tokyo, uh, uh, and faculties at the University of Washington who helped me to develop my uh, presentation. And I'd like to uh, happy to uh, answer uh, questions if you have. I'd like to comment on the film. Um, some of my impressions are how remarkably calm uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, the personnel were, mm -hmm. I mean, it seems that, I don't, and I don't know, in America, it seems like there would be more people screaming and yelling and stuff. And, but the, the patients themselves were remarkably calm. But it, um, even if there was chaos occurring, mm -hmm. I have to compliment your hospital staff for really, mm -hmm. it, you know, everything was calm. It looks like things were, were mm -hmm. going on, maybe mm -hmm. a little disorganized, but people were keeping their heads. And it was very mm -hmm. reassuring to see that. The one thing that's not reassuring is that how unprepared we are for an unknown uh, a disaster to occur is, mm -hmm. is that I look at the hospital personnel and there was you know no gowning and gloves yeah. and stuff. But on the other hand, when 500 people walk into your ER, what do you do? Um, and hopefully you'll address what we can do to become a little bit more prepared for um, an unknown sort of attack. But a remarkable piece of film. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think the, the most patients are too sick, so they cannot the, even the speak or yell. And that's why it's relatively very uh, quiet and calm. And also, this incident uh, um, happened uh, incidentally, so that even though uh, most physicians, providers working at general ward, they do not usually wear the uh, gloves and the garments. So uh, they are probably supposed to uh, wear the uh, gown and uh, gloves to prevent the uh, secondary contamination. But at the time, we didn't think about anything about the gas or the sec uh, secondary contamination. So yeah, probably you should uh, uh, prepare, uh, uh, tell uh, your providers to at least wear some gowns and gloves to take when they take care of the uh, uh, patients. Uh, suffering from probably unknown causative some agents. I, uh, I second what was said before regarding the re remarkable response mm -hmm. both of the populace as well as mm -hmm. the um, uh, hospital staff. And as I'm listening through, I mean, some themes that you see across any disaster, such as logistics, such mm -hmm. as triage you raised. One piece, though, which I think was shown uh, even more so in the uh, Hurricane Katrina debacle in this country, mm -hmm. but was at the very beginning of your presentation, you said that you, you were in conference, you were provided a piece of information. There's a gas main exposure. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. Finish your conference. Mm -hmm. We'll do things later. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking back in the language of statistics, in effect, what you were communicated was a point estimator mm -hmm. without any variance estimator, without any mm -hmm. idea about how certain or uncertain are we that the information that is being communicated is correct. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about, in situations like this, the importance of, of communicating not only the best guess, but the degree of uncertainty in, and how that feeds into uh, planning. Well, I don't have a um, good answer to your question, but we need to uh, have some uh, modality to uh, communicate better. I mean, and also, as I presented uh, in my talk, the, uh, somehow you need to have a uh, um, modality to ask for enormous help if you need it, if you think you need it. And uh, um, it's very hard to. Uh, guess the, uh, the degree um, of the, uh, the incident, I think. So yeah, you should have some um, adjustment the way. You should have some uh, the, um, the way to adjust your uh, reactions, responses to the event. Did that answer to your question? <laughs> so. uh, I noticed that uh, the res uh, the persons at the hospital who were responding, uh, mm -hmm. moving out uh, the wheeled stretchers, uh, they didn't look like uh, physicians or clinical staff. And uh, I'm wondering uh, if, if, if that was the case, whether administrative staff were uh, administrative joining staff. in. That's right. All yeah. the staffs, including administrative staff and uh, 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 um, security people and the clerks, all the people who are available come down, came down to the EL and help the patients. Mm -hmm. yep. And my second question is, I noticed a lot of victims had uh, handkerchiefs or hands mm -hmm. over their mouth. And mm -hmm. 
was wondering if if they, there was a lot of lacrimation or That's nausea right. or mm -hmm. whether there was a reason for that other than, I mean, they obviously were too ill to be concealing their identity. So, uh, so it was because of s symptoms. Yes, I yeah. think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing that uh, with you. us. It's really quite moving seeing the film and hearing of this. I would think with you're talking about the authority to ask for enormous help, mm -hmm. I would think that uh, that would probably need to come from fire departments or police departments, that they should be the ones likely to communicate to hospitals to get all available personnel. Mm -hmm. And whether you know whether people know that, uh, I, I suppose they don't necessarily know that, you know, locally or nationally, that that would be the way. Uh, and hospitals should know, you know, that this if they receive a call from the fire department or police department to mobilize all personnel, that that might actually save lives. Uh, and so, but uh, I, I don't imagine we've really considered that, but I would think it would have to come from people out in the field that would see the enormity of the situation. It wouldn't be coming from you know, the emergency room. It should come some step before the emergency room, I would think. Uh, I think the, uh, we didn't, as I, as I have already mentioned, we did not have a good modality to communicate with other outside agencies, such as fire department police. And also, the outside agency, the firefighter and the police department, did not realize, recognize the, uh, the magnitude of the incident. That's why I think they couldn't tell the, how serious this uh, attack was. And uh, the president of the hospital came down to the EL and see so the many victims, the patients are coming. That uh, made him uh, to make a decision. We needed to cancel all clinics and uh, uh, the operations. If you're the, the president of your institution just sitting in his room and just listening to the report, he may not be able to uh, make a decision quickly as first uh, uh, as possible. So I think Again, it's very important to uh, communicate constantly to uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, outside agencies as well as the, uh, 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 the providers who are actually working at EO and wars and, and so on. Any other question? Will you, be, will you be addressing any of the sequelae from secondary exposures? Yes. Any other question? Okay. Back to an offshoot of the, my initial comment about the fire department, police department, it would seem whether, I don't know whether there's, this film has been distributed such that uh, fire departments and police departments, you know, across the country and maybe even hospital administrators or emergency room personnel, it would seem a useful thing for uh, especially those groups of people to be aware of to see uh, to see that and whether that uh, you know how to implement that and whether that's been done in Japan uh, too or but it would seem like it would point out some things that might uh, be useful as far as getting people to think about how they might respond to a, a situation like that thank you well, of course, it will be available now, including uh, Dr. Tineda's narration. So uh, any ideas about how to distribute it? And you know, we'd be willing to entertain them. Yeah. <laughs> any other comment or question? OK, thank you very much for your kind attention. That concludes this session.